God's forgiveness. It is the story of the love of God for all creation. It is a story that we are all interconnected through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Our story is to tell of God's unmerited grace and forgiveness. God's love for all creation and the interconnectedness of all humanity. Yes, there is ugliness in the world. We see it recently in the attacks in London and Manchester and Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and many other places. Our world seems to think that violence, whatever, in whatever form, is a legitimate way to solve problems. Sadly, the rhetoric we hear these days encourages others to commit acts of ugliness against other persons, nations, and ethnic groups. Somehow I think if we ever learned it, we have forgotten that God, what God created was good and it was beautiful. On a personal level, I remember when I was in high school that I struggled with my own self-image as a lot of high school teenagers do. I didn't like the way I looked. I somehow didn't feel comfortable with my own skin and my own who I was emotionally and other things. And I think when you feel that way that others sometimes pick up that sense. And I found myself being bullied by some of the students. To this day, I remember one student in particular, I was the equipment manager for the football team, which makes you somewhat vulnerable to begin with anyway. <laughs> But one of those football players decided it was his project to demean me in any way that he could. He made fun of me. Even at times, he would hit me. You have to understand that I'm of the age when people didn't really think bullying was bad. They just accepted it. It's rather amazing that over time, Time, over time, how something like that sticks in your memory. I certainly didn't feel beautiful at that point in my life. And sadly, that negative self-image can become very destructive for a person and often is projected out upon other people as they put others down to falsely build themselves up. I was fortunate that I was able to some degree move beyond that to the love of others and saw something different than I saw in myself. It took a while. <clears throat> but I stand here today because I was able to move beyond that. In some ways, I wish we didn't have to have pride week. Now, before you run me out of town on a rail for saying that, I need to add that sadly, I have often heard people say, I love gays, but I wish they wouldn't flaunt it. To me, that is a basic contradiction to the story of creation and the love of Christ. To me, it means I'll love as long as you fit into my way of seeing the world. And it's very restrictive. Many of you know I'm United Methodist, and if any of you follow me, think you know that we're a denomination that's in great turmoil right now over the homosexual issue of whether we should ordain homosexuals or not. I fear that my own denomination may split over that issue, which is so sad. But you see, the world of God is not a world of conditional love. There are no restrictions on the love of God for us. When we truly see each other, the beauty and goodness of God, then at least in one sense, we see that in others. Pride week would not need to exist. There is ugliness in the world of nature not caused by creation itself, but by those who see God's creation not as a thing of beauty, but as something to use for their own self-interest. We use and abuse creation for our selfish wants. Wendell, Wendell Berry talks about it this way. We will discover that God found the world as he made it to be good, that he made it for his pleasure, and that he continues to love it and find it worthy. Despite its reduction and corruption by us, people who go quote John 3.16, you know, whoever so loved him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As an easy form of their forgetting to heaven, neglect to see the great difficulty implied in the statement that the advent of Christ was made possible by God's love for the world, not God's love for heaven, or for a world that, as it might be, 
but for the world as, as it was and is. Belief in Christ is thus made dependent upon prior belief in the inherent goodness, the lovability of the world. We will discover that the creation is not in any sense independent of the creator, the result of, of a primal creative act long ago and long over and done with, but as a continuous constant participation of the creatures in the being of God. Now we may wonder about the inherent goodness of mosquitoes or cockroaches, but in their own way they play a vital part in the food chain of life. Try to explain that to some camper who's getting beat up by mosquitoes, though it doesn't work real well. <laughs> However, the Genesis 1 story is not the only creation story in the Bible. The other story of creation in Genesis 2 is humans made from dirt and mud. And of course, the word used to name man created by God, Adam, implies a Hebrew word for earth. And it's interesting, it also applies red. So who knows, maybe here in East Tennessee, creation started. But even more so, our DNA is with the earth. According to the creation story in Genesis 2, we are inextricably tied to the natural world. Now we might not have actually been formed from the dirt of earth, but what the story tells us is that our ties to the earth begin at the very beginning. But that isn't necessarily unique. Many cultures have creation myths that involve being formed from mud and dirt. It tries to tell how their people came into being. The biblical stories of creation have something that most call their cultures don't have. Our creation stories declare that all creation is good and beautiful. And that the creation isn't just for one group of people. It is not our, just our parochial understanding of the Creator. God's creation is a story of universality, that God has no favorites. Mm -hmm. 